Hello YouTube. I know it's been a while, but uh, I think it's time to finish the series that I started on consent. Uh, in the previous videos, we have examined the conditions that undermine consent, and we've examined the ontology of consent. Exactly, you know, what, what exactly, what kind of thing is consent? Uh, is it subjective or performative? Um, Today we're going to look at the moral significance of consent. The basic question here is uh, how much does consent matter, morally speaking? We can begin by defining what we might call uh, the liberal view. And this claims that consent is necessary and sufficient to make sex morally acceptable. So to say that consent is necessary is to say that any sexual activity without consent is thereby morally wrong which is fairly intuitive. Uh, to say that consent is sufficient is to say that provided everybody involved is consenting, then the, the sexual activity is acceptable. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can have um, vaginal sex, anal sex, oral sex, foot jobs, hand jobs, whatever. Uh, you can have sex with the opposite gender or with the same gender. You can be uh, promiscuous. Uh, you can have sex with many different people, e even at all at the same time. Uh, you can have a big sex party, whatever, whatever you want, it's all okay, as long as everybody is consenting. Uh, but, but you need to have the consent, the consent is necessary. I think that this kind of view is fairly popular these days, at least with, um, you know, with the, with the sort of liberal-minded people, uh, the, the liberal view, that's why it's called the liberal view. Uh, most, most people that I know would probably accept something like this. Now, there are several reasons to favour the liberal view. Uh, I'll mention three just just briefly. Um, well, first of all, uh, once we start saying that certain kinds of sex are morally wrong, even among consenting adults, we uh, open the doors to authoritarianism and paternalism and uh, state intervention in our private lives. We value privacy. We want to keep the government from snooping on what we do in our own bedrooms. The liberal view um, prevents that. Uh, second, uh, there's an argument from individual autonomy. I have uh, a maximal ownership of my own body. I get to decide what happens to my body. So if I want to um, get fisted by a dwarf while two transvestites urinate on me, well, that might be weird, but hey, it's my body. Third, there's uh, a utilitarian case for the liberal view. Utilitarianism is the view that we should maximise happiness and minimise suffering. Now, if all parties are consenting, there is a presumption that the sex is a net positive for all parties. After all, if it wasn't positive, all things considered, for all parties, why would they consent to it? Now, of course, some people sometimes do things that are bad for them, but in general, I know better than you do what's good for me. So if two people want to engage in a certain sex act, and they both, you know, if two people consent to it, there should be a presumption that it's better for both people that the sex occur than that it not occur. Um, so, I mean, that's all fairly trivial, um, and that all supports the liberal view. Now, one thing I do want to know is that although the liberal view is probably our, um, our basic position these days, very few people hold it absolutely. There are a few exceptions. Consider, for instance, incest. If a brother and sister want to have sex, even if they're both consenting adults, many people will feel that this is morally wrong or should be illegal. I don't agree with that. I have a video on incest where I defend it. Um, but unfortunately, in my opinion, this is a particular case where the liberal view is not applied. But I think that generally speaking, most people these days would say that what other people do in the bedroom is their own business, provided we're all consenting adults. So in this video, um, we're going to look at some challenges to the liberal view. Uh, and for this, I'm drawing on Robin West's article, Sex, Law and Consent. Uh, West distinguishes two challenges to the liberal view, radical feminism and queer theory. Well, first of all, let's consider radical feminism. Radical feminism is uh, associated with people like Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin, uh, and it, it argues that the problem with the liberal view is that there's simply no clear distinction between uh, consensual and non-consensual sex. Um, I mean, Obviously, the liberal view requires that we are able to draw a sharp line between consensual and non-consensual sex. But this is what the radical feminist tries to challenge. So, uh, fundamental to consent is the notion of coercion. 
As we saw in the first video, the presence of coercion is one of the factors that can undermine consent. And the radical feminist claim is that we can't clearly distinguish coercive from non-coercive sex. Even in the context of a long-term loving relationship where both partners seem very enthusiastic about having sex with each other, even this may be a product of coercion. Why? Well, the basic argument is that uh, our culture is saturated with coercive forces with respect to sex. And I think this kind of comes in from, from two directions. First of all, there is a culture of oppression against women. Radical feminism views men and women as uh, separate classes in something like the Marxist sense, where women are oppressed by men. We live in a patriarchal male-dominated society. Women are paid less than men. There are fewer women than men in powerful positions and in, in, in like politics and in private companies. Um, historically, men have been granted more rights than women, like the right to vote, all of which means that the basic institutions of our society have been constructed by men uh, and according to the radical feminists they've been constructed for men so the, the the structure of our society the kind of society we have is one where women are subordinate to and often dependent on men furthermore uh, from birth men and women are treated differently men are brought up to be dominant and assertive whereas women are brought up to be more passive and to value things like tenderness and sensitivity and submissiveness uh, parents tend to treat male and female children differently um, for example parents are more likely to discourage female children from engaging in risky behaviors like tree climbing or play fighting the toy industry makes guns for boys and dolls for girls. The education system often gives boys and girls different tasks. Uh, in my school, during the uh, physical education, boys were made to play rugby and other, uh, other kind of contact sports, whereas girls played less aggressive sports. Uh, so, uh, again, the men are sort of brought up to be this, to be dominant and assertive, and hence they're more likely to influence the culture and, you know, construct the culture as to, to be for them, whereas women end up being more submissive. Women have been treated as second-class citizens for thousands of years. Obviously things are better today, but even in the modern world, the radical feminist alleges that women are severely disadvantaged relative to men. The mechanisms of the patriarchy are more subtle today, but they are still in, in play. So there's, so there's first of all this, this general culture of, of oppression against women and a general culture where uh, kind of men are in control and women are uh, submissive and dependent. Second, our culture is highly sexualized. Um, pornography is available uh, at quite literally the click of a button with, with the internet and, uh, and it often tends to show women in extremely submissive roles. Uh, all forms of, of media from TV shows to movies to music to books and so on place a heavy emphasis on sex and titillation and women are constantly sexually objectified, reduced to just body parts for men to admire. Think about how often films show gratuitous nudity and sex while often leaving female characters undeveloped in terms of their uh, personalities and so on. There's, um, there's that famous test, uh, the Bechdel test, where a film only passes if... Uh, what is it? If two if two women talk to each other about something other than a man, so the Bechdel test says, uh, you know, a film, a film or TV show only passes if there are two women in it who talk to each other about something other than a man. Surprisingly, there are very few films that pass this apparently simple test, which suggests that female characters very very rarely have substantial roles in stories. The overall picture then is that the media presents women mostly just to show off their bodies rather than to emphasise their skills, lives, personalities. You know, the, the, the value of a woman is her, is just her body, her appearance. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, not, uh, you know, that, that's uh, become quite a controversy in, in, in Hollywood. Um, I remember reading this, quite a lot of actresses objecting to the fact that after, after the, once they start getting older, you know, the, the ability to get roles just, just drops off, whereas the same isn't true of male actors. They can keep getting roles into their 50s, 60s and so on, but it, it really drops off once, once women get older. Um, so, you know, it's, it seems like the only value is, is the body. Um, and now, although our culture is 
sexualized, the emphasis is on heterosexuality in particular. Heterosexuality is normalized and people are pressured into it. Perhaps not explicitly forced into it these days, but there's still significant cultural pressure. Uh, the, the result of all this is that males are taught to be entitled towards women and sex, while women are taught to accept sex. Um, uh, you know, we, we have a, a, a system, a culture where men oppress women, a culture which is highly sexualized and where heterosexuality is expected. The, the result is that men are entitled towards sex, women are taught to just accept it. In the past, um, the, the sort of religious traditions held that women must submit to their husbands. In modern society, since the sexual revolution, women are now expected to submit to sex basically across the board. They're expected to be sex objects for men. In either case, sex is used to keep women in a submissive position. So says the radical feminist. Now, there are many ways uh, that men manipulate women into sex. Um, Robin Morgan, for instance, uh, notes that men compel women into sex not just by, and I quote, a knife blade against the throat, but also uh, in his body language, his threat of sulking, his clenched or trembling hands, his self-deprecating humour, or angry put-down, or silent self-pity at being rejected. Um, let's say a husband tries to initiate sex with his wife. She refuses, he starts sulking, maybe becomes silent and doesn't talk to her. Morgan seems to be suggesting that this isn't just rude, it's actually unacceptably coercive. Because women are taught to be more passive, and because women are dependent on men for their financial security and things like that, the wife doesn't have a genuine ability to say no. If the wife ultimately acquiesces and has sex with him, this will be uh, rape, or at least it, it will be seriously morally wrong. Uh, so the, the, the liberal view then uh, simply ignores any kind of pressure other than outright force. So according to the radical feminist, it vastly underestimates the amount of morally questionable sex. Um, Pamela Foer puts it quite bluntly. She says, and I quote, the special wrongness of rape is due to, and is only an exaggeration of, the wrongness of our sexual interactions in general. Rape is just at the very extreme end of a spectrum of moral wrongs that, uh, that, that characterises all our sexual interactions. The liberal view is, um, is highly individualistic. It tends to view sexual relations outside of any social context. So provided that both people say yes or they otherwise signify agreement there's sort of there's nothing further to question you know there's there's nothing there's no further moral issue that might arise because you're just looking at the relation between those two people in contrast uh, the radical feminist views sex in the context of the the attitudes the practices and institutions of what they consider to be a deeply oppressive patriarchal society in this context it's unclear in what sense women really have the capacity to provide genuine consent. So the radical feminist uh, claims that women are pushed to engage in unwanted sex in all kinds of ways. Outright violence and force is just one kind of pressure among many. Furthermore, even, even if women do genuinely want sex, even if they enthusiastically desire it, their apparent consent is not of any clear relevance for two reasons. First of all, because they don't really have the ability to decline. By comparison, consider slavery. Arguably, if a slave owner has sex with a slave, this is, this is just necessarily rape. Because even if the slave really wants to do it, even if she enthusiastically wants to, she doesn't have the ability to resist because she's a slave. If she were, if she were, if she were to say no, she would be forced into it anyway, uh, because the slave owner has the right to treat her however he, wish, however he wishes. And the thought is that genuine consent requires the ability to refuse, and slaves don't have that ability. Now, obviously, women are not slaves, but uh, the radical feminist thinks that they are in an extremely subordinate position with lots of social and economic pressures and so on. So um, they may not be outright slaves, but the, the same kind of uh, power dynamic is uh, is in play. The second reason for the irrelevance of consent is that 
Private sexual relations are a kind of political act, since uh, sexual activity between men and women is one way in which the oppression against women is perpetuated. Consider again slavery. If a black person chooses to be a slave to white people, this personal choice actively harms other black people by uh, contributing to the perpetuation of the unjust system of slavery. In the same way, even if a woman enthusiastically wants to have sex with a man, this perpetuates the patriarchal culture that oppresses women. Uh, no woman has the moral right to contribute to the oppression of other women. Uh, to be clear, I mean, perhaps not all kinds of sex between men and women are bad, but uh, according to the radical feminists, most of them are. Very often in the bedroom, women will allow themselves to be used and dominated. They will uh, allow themselves to be sex objects for men. But this harms other women by promoting male dominance. Hence, it's not something that you can uh, legitimately consent to. Or, you know, you, I mean, maybe you can consent to it, but, um, you know, you still that, that it's still morally wrong. Now, there are several problems with the radical feminist approach. Um, first of all, it arguably has, uh, perhaps paradoxically, misogynistic consequences. This is because it seems to rest on the assumption that women are generally averse to sex. It treats sex as something that is uh, done to women by men and that women generally don't want to engage in. Uh, sex is something pleasurable for men and bad for women. A woman uh, can't, or at least very rarely can, enthusiastically embrace sex. Furthermore, it treats women as, um, as passive, as incapable of asserting their own will. The will of every individual woman with respect to sex is simply overridden by these coercive social forces. Uh, when a woman says she wants sex and says that the sex will be good for her, the radical feminist denies her will and claims to know better. Ultimately, then, radical feminism leads to an extremely traditionalist and paternalistic view of women's relationship to sex and to a, a denial of women's autonomy. Um, it may be worth noting that historically, uh, radical feminists have sometimes allied themselves with uh, conservative religious fundamentalists. In the, uh, in the 80s, there was a campaign for legal restrictions on pornography led by Andrea Dworkin and others, and I believe that they um, were sort of at times supported and allied with the Catholic Church. Um, so the point is, uh, radical feminism is arguably just insulting to women. Uh, I'd also note that it's insulting to actual rape victims. By saying that all sex exists on a spectrum of rape, you deny the special victimhood of, of genuine victims. Um, you know, it sort of it, it diminishes the, the horror of, of non-consensual sex. So uh, it arguably is, is, is just an insulting, misogynistic view. A second problem is that coercive forces are too vaguely defined. Consider, for instance, the claim that our culture is highly sexualized and women are brought up to be passive and accepting of this. This may be true, and perhaps we think that this is a problem, but it's not clear how this is supposed to constitute literal coercion. Um, I mean, yes, cultural pressure can be powerful, but it's not irresistible. That's how culture changes. Individuals can decide to go against the grain. Um, in any case, uh, I mean, as a matter of fact, all of the coercive forces that the radical feminist identifies are indeed resisted by, uh, not just by individuals, but by powerful movements. Um, you know, the the, the sexualisation of culture, for instance, is resisted both by religious traditionalists, it's resisted by some academics in psychology and sociology, it's resisted by feminists, and so on, and so forth. I mean, consider again the analogy to slavery. We noted that if a slave owner has sex with a slave, that would arguably count as rape, because even if the slave enthusiastically wants it, um, the slave doesn't have the ability to decline. Now, that's the kind of coercive force that can nullify consent. And while that might be a suggestive analogy for the radical feminist, it is only an analogy, because women are not slaves. Um, even if they may be subordinate to men, or they may be second-class citizens in some sense, they're not slaves. And in practice, women are perfectly capable of declining sex. They decline sex all the time. Furthermore, 
even granting that we have a clear definition of coercive forces, I'm not, and it's not entirely clear why they're supposed to be a problem. I mean, let's think about coercive forces and social pressures in other contexts. Suppose that all of your friends watch Game of Thrones and they often talk about it, and you're starting to feel left out. You're not um, particularly interested in watching Game of Thrones, but you want to be able to participate in the uh, discussions that your friends are having. Now, pretty clearly, you're under some sort of pressure here to watch Game of Thrones, so you watch it. Now, is that a moral problem? I would say no, because there's nothing intrinsically wrong with watching Game of Thrones. Um, and the same is true of many other cases. As a result of social pressure, you may be pushed to do more exercise, or to eat more healthily, or to abstain from drug use. Um, yeah, and, and, and there's no problem with that. And in fact, even if you're pushed to do bad things, maybe you're pushed to eat a bit too much chocolate cake, or you're pushed to smoke cannabis. I'm not inclined to view that as a moral problem either. So sex is not intrinsically bad. It's often quite fun. Sometimes it's not fun, but even bad sex isn't really a big deal. Um, I mean, my girlfriend has had people before me who were boring or a bit gross or whatever, and we often laugh about them now. Her experiences weren't pleasant at the time, but they certainly weren't traumatic. So does it really matter if there's this nebulous social pressure to to have sex. It's not really clear to me that that's a problem at all. Third, if we apply, if we attempt to apply the radical feminist view in law, it would seem to have some extremely authoritarian consequences. Now, to be fair, I don't think any radical feminist has actually argued that we should have the police go around to people's homes and uh, arrest any man caught having sex with a woman. But radical feminists have certainly campaigned for legal restrictions on prostitution, on pornography, on practices like BDSM. Um, I think that they are far too complacent about major expansions of, of government authority. And um, so maybe that would be another worry. Finally, uh, according to Robin West, the main problem with the radical feminist critique is that even granting the premise that um, so-called consensual sex is acquired through co coercion, even granting that premise, the fact remains that the coercive forces that lead to consent are simply not equivalent to non-consensual sex. In other words, the coercive forces that elicit consent are not the same as the coercive forces that override consent. Consider, for instance, being burgled in one's house or robbed on the street, in contrast to being exploited by an unscrupulous employer. Very arguably, uh, workplace exploitation occurs due to various social and economic pressures. Nobody wants to work for a bad employer. People do it because they don't really have a choice. In this sense, um, we might draw an analogy between a bad workplace and a robbery. In both cases, you're being coerced. Uh, in some sense, into giving up something of value to you. But notice that there's still a significant difference between the two things. Robbery is simply far more traumatic, far more of an invasion. There's more fear. Um, there's a, a sense of immediate danger, since if you're held up on the street, there's the possibility that you might be injured or killed. Or if your house is robbed uh, or burgled, a place that should be safe and comforting has been violated there's a sense of a complete lack of control. It's abnormal, it's not in the standard course of things, it's not something that you have any experience dealing with. So the same is, is the case for rape. Even if we accept the radical feminist premise that all sex is saturated with these coercive forces and that women are constantly pressured into sex, the fact remains that there's just a radical difference in the phenomenology of uh, agreeing to sex due to some cultural and economic pressure uh, and being forced into sex by a rapist. When your consent is elicited due to, due to cultural pressure, that's, that's just not as psychologically or physically traumatic as having your consent simply ignored. So there are several reasons to uh, be sceptical about um, the, the radical feminist challenge to the liberal view. A second attack on the liberal view is given by queer theory. Now, I should note that I take the name queer theory from Robin West's article. Um, I, um, I'm, I don't know if people who identify as, as queer theorists would appreciate being associated with this view, but this is, um, th this is the, the name that Robin West gives to, to this view. Um, 
So recall that the, that the basic thrust of the radical feminist view is that there's no clear moral distinction between consensual and non-consensual sex. Radical feminists conclude that consensual sex is much more morally suspect than we intuitively suppose. Queer theorists accept the premise, but draw the opposite conclusion. They agree that there's no clear moral distinction between consensual and non-consensual sex, and they conclude that much of what we would regard as non-consensual sex is in fact morally permissible. So obviously this is quite a um, disturbing view in, in some ways. Queer theory uh, asserts that sex is good, especially when it is transgressive, unconstrained, deviant, and so on. Sex is both uh, intrinsically good just for its own sake, and it also has great political force, since uh, it's, sex is a powerful way of challenging authority. Um, traditional moralities often focus on sex. They use sexual repression as a means of control. When sex is rebellious and deviant, this is a powerful way of attacking those oppressive moralities. Um, and the, the, the queer theorist thinks that the, the harms of non-consensual sex are just, they're just not especially serious, and they pale in comparison to the goodness of, of sex. I, I find it hard to believe that anybody seriously holds the, uh, the queer theoretic view. West attributes this view to Janet Halley, David Kennedy, and uh, Michel Foucault. Is that how you pronounce his name? You know that French philosopher... Um, I would I would intuitively pronounce it Michael Foucault, but I believe it's uh, Michel Foucault because you know the the French don't believe in pronouncing the letters that they put in into words for some reason. Um, but anyway, uh, West attributes this, this view to to those people. I'm not really sure that this is fair. Uh, maybe the the Marquis de Sade he might have held it, although again it's not obvious that he was expressing his genuine beliefs in his work. Um, but certainly, I mean, we can we can consider it. I'm not sure if anybody holds this view, but it may be worth considering uh, as a challenge to the liberal view. So, what are the arguments? Well, as noted, one argument uh, is is just to accept the radical feminist premise that there's no clear way of demarcating consensual from non-consensual sex, and then drawing the opposite conclusion. Of course, if the if the queer theorist adopts the radical feminist premise. Obviously, um, it faces many of the same problems as radical feminism, which I won't rehearse again. According to West, another motivation for this view uh, rests largely on a, a purely pragmatic argument. So this is the worry that in uh, modern culture, rape is too easy to allege. Our culture is too easily led into moral panics about rape. There's too much punishment too much involvement of the state in our personal lives. And we have a tendency to uh, assume guilty until proven innocent in rape and sexual assault cases. We assume that if somebody is accused of rape or sexual assault, they probably did it before any trial has taken place. Um, just as an example, uh, a couple of years ago, there was an article in, in Rolling Stone called A Rape on Campus by Sabrina, uh, El Sabrina Erdely. And it was an expose of a supposed gang rape that had taken place at the University of Virginia. Uh, in fact, it was completely fabricated. Um, and these sorts of hoaxes, you know, they do seem to happen quite often. And very often people just accept them without much critical thinking. Part of the problem, I, I think, is that if you ever express any scepticism about a claim of rape or sexual assault, there, there are a lot of people who will attack you for victim blaming, um, or some, you know, th things along those lines. Similarly, uh, many people have voiced concerns about increasingly restrictive attitudes to consent. You might have seen that video, uh, Consent is Sexy, I think it was titled. I think the original video has been taken down, because when I, I looked it up on YouTube, I, I didn't see it. Um, but it's still available on uh, the Young Turks channel. If you, if you type in Consent is Sexy on YouTube, there's a video by the Young Turks where they they show the video and then, then talk about it. And it's supposed to be an example of how consent ideally works. Um, and, you know, go and watch the video, see what you think. I have to say, I think it's the least sexy thing I've ever seen. Um, now, the point of the video was to promote uh, this idea of affirmative consent, which is the idea that consent has to be explicitly given, uh, enthusiastically explicitly given uh, every step of the way. Um, just because you don't object to something doesn't mean that you consent. You only consent to a sex act if you explicitly agree to it. This has become quite popular, it's been written into law in some places, but is it right? Well, there may be some reasons to worry about this. Um, 
uh, let's say that uh, you've gone out on a date with a, a guy, it goes really well, you go back to his house, you start watching a movie or whatever, and as you're watching it, you know, he starts uh, touching you, maybe moves to the breasts, puts his hand down your trousers, whatever. Now, provided that you are fully conscious and fully aware and you're able to object, it seems kind of plausible to say that if you don't object as he's doing this, then he's done nothing wrong. Um, you have, in fact, consented. Um, you know, if you don't want to do something, then you do have a responsibility to voice objections if you have them, and the failure to voice any objection, uh, to either say no or to push him away or anything like that, the failure to do any of that in itself signals consent. Um, that seems like a plausible sort of view to me, uh, and in that kind of case you you wouldn't want to accept the uh, the affirmative consent standard. So, um, you know, with all of this considered then, there is a, a worry with respect to uh, how quick we are to uh, turn rape into a moral panic. And the queer theory resists this uh, by by denying that non-consensual sex is sufficiently harmful to warrant such responses. Of course, the main problem here is that this kind of pra pragmatic argument simply doesn't establish the queer theoretic conclusion. This is really an argument for being careful about how we apply rape law. It's not an argument that non-consensual sex isn't really a big deal. Um, I mean, we, we might think, for instance, that copyright law is becoming too restrictive and too authoritarian, but that's hardly an argument for just doing away with copyright in general, or for thinking that there's no moral problem with ever violating copyright. Similarly, if we think that, for instance, affirmative consent standards are too authoritarian, too restrictive, the proper response to that is to object to those specific standards, not just to throw out the concept of consent wholesale. So that argument, I think, is just not persuasive at all. Uh, another argument for the queer theoretic conclusion might appeal to um, something that we've discussed in previous videos. Uh, we discussed Tom Doherty's argument that even uh, minor deceptions or seemingly minor deceptions can undermine consent. Uh, so if Sarah only ever has sex, sex with political conservatives and I pretend to be a conservative so that she will have sex with me, then, uh, on Doherty's view, I've literally committed rape by deception. I've undermined Sarah's ability to give informed consent to sex with me. Now, Doherty hopes that we will conclude that uh, since non-consensual sex is, is seriously wrong, then using minor deceptions to acquire sex is also seriously wrong. But notice that we might take it in the other direction. We might instead argue, um, OK, deception undermines consent, but using such deceptions is clearly morally acceptable, uh, or at least it's not seriously wrong. Uh, you know, it's just part of the game of dating. So non-consensual sex is at least sometimes acceptable or not seriously wrong. Uh, the famous, as the famous, or at least the famous in philosophy saying goes, uh, one person's modus ponens is another person's modus tollens. Perhaps all Doherty's argument really shows is that consent isn't always all that important. There are contexts where it doesn't really matter if sex is non non consensual. Uh, okay. Um, I think that's enough for now. I'll, I'll look at uh, another argument for the queer theoretic view and uh, a few uh, other considerations about it in the next video. But um, I'm, I'm going to stop here. So, uh, as I say, we'll, we'll continue this shortly. Goodbye.